Thank you. Um, this is uh, welcome to the policy committee meeting, April 20th, 2021. Uh, Julie, have we been properly posted? Yes, we have. Thank you. Now would be the opportunity for citizens to uh, speak. I have none. Nobody signed it in yet. Okay, thank you. Then we'll move directly into the action items this evening, the approval of our minutes from our uh, March meeting. Dan? I so move. move. I'll second, please. And move for approval. Any questions or discussions or changes in the minutes? No, sir. Seeing none. All in favor of accepting the minutes from March, please say aye. 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 Opposed? 3 0, Julie. Okay, we have uh, three action items before us this, e this, e this evening in three different categories, actually. Uh, the first one is one of those in the legal category revision to policy 5111. Let me get up on that. Eligibility of resident non-resident students uh, a few changes in here joe do you want to yeah uh, so this just gets us in compliance with what the uh, state statute says about um resident uh non-resident students in the district um and then home-based uh, private education so if you look at the policy um there are a couple of additions um uh, line e uh clarifies we i mean this is a very simple change it, used to just have the number nine through 12. It now has the words uh, so that there's no confusion. Um, under item F, students enrolled in a home-based private education program uh, in grades kindergarten through eight uh, who meet the minimum standards for admissions uh, could take up to two classes if there's sufficient space. Uh, when we talked about this last time, um, sufficient space is determined at the time of open enrollment uh, determination, which goes back to January. Um, and if I recall, it's open space, but not necessarily by building, right? Correct. It's open space in the district. So second grade is looked at across all of our elementary schools in the second grade, third grade, so on and so forth. Um, uh, o, uh, again, there's it's a sufficient space clarification. Non-resident students may be accepted in the district's program under full-time open enrollment. Um, uh, Non-resident students who accept the district part-time enrollment uh, may attend no more than two courses at any time if the board determines there's sufficient space. So again, it goes down to the, spe the uh, sufficient space requirement, and that keeps us in compliance with the statutes listed on the bottom of the page. Okay, and in, in this case, this is one of those that falls under the category of legal specified that we have to do this, so. Correct, yep, board, this committee approves it and then we update the whole board on it. Okay. Dan? And I move that we approve the revisions to policy number 5111, eligibility of resident, non-resident students as presented. Okay, thank you. I'll second, please. Okay, any further uh, discussion, questions on these? Seeing none, just we'll take this immediately. If all those in favor of accepting the changes to 5111, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Three zero. Uh, I keep going to say Lynn. Sorry, Julie. <laughs> okay. And with that, we can move to six six zero five crowdfunding. Okay. This is a. Recommended changes. Um, in fact, it's quite. A, no, no, that's one. Next one, it has a lot. This one has a few changes to it. Joe, do you want to? Yeah, we just wanted to make sure that we had policy language in place that if there is crowdfunding going on, and crowdfunding is the uh, like the GoFundMe stuff, it's the using social media to to get funds. That we're very clear as to you know the purpose behind that, and then the. Um, you know, who essentially owns the outcome of it. And uh, so what we have in here, the additional language uh, in green, for purposes of the policy, crowdfunding is defined as the solicitation of resources from individuals or organizations to support identified activities or projects that enhance the educational program or a specific cause approved by the district. The solicitation, it's typically from a large number of individuals utilizing internet-based technology. So we wanted to clarify what crowdfunding was, how we defined it. 
And then all approved crowdfunding activities shall protect the privacy of students. We do not want kids uh, uh, to be the center of it, um, their images, their actions and such. You know, Whittier Elementary School, okay. Um, so, such and such as fourth grade class where they're featuring the kids, not okay. Um, young adults in accordance with board policy, district administrative guidelines, and applicable state and federal laws. Materials, supplies, and equipment. This is kind of the big caveat on it. We had to deal with this a number of years ago as crowdfunding was becoming popular. Uh, if you crowdfund for your classroom, that property becomes property of the school district. So if you want to buy a unique workspace, that doesn't follow you should you find employment elsewhere. That stays in the classroom where you worked. Um, materials, supplies, equipment, and other proceeds of the crowdfunding shall become property of the district. Cash or equivalent payment to the district personnel is prohibited. All fiscal transactions shall comply with appropriate board policies. So we had the business office review this and make sure that it, you know, we don't want people to inadvertently walk into a fraud or intentionally walk into a situation where they're, you know, in violation of some sort of fraud policy. So we wanted to be clear around that. Is this commonly used in our district? I've only heard of it once or twice. It's not commonly used, but it is something that is obviously more and more popular and, okay. you know, kind of the general society so we wanted to make sure we put some parameters around it okay Dan? i believe the most recent one was the uh, the crowdfunding for the alternate prom at south could you repeat that please i think one of the most recent ones was the crowdfunding for the alternative prom at south okay that wouldn't have been a district-based crowdfunding that was an individual a private citizen that was seeking funding for that okay the district we had prom this have or had proms i don't exactly know the well, that was homecoming that was alternative for homecoming so yeah so i mean that's yeah that wasn't district sponsored okay um, that was an individual who said the district won't allow us to do this so we're going to go at it alone donate to have waukesha south's so they ran, they ran their own program but they then they could contribute that chunk of money back into the district? They didn't contribute it to the district. They used it to fund their prom or their oh, homecoming. homecoming. Oh, homecoming. Oh, oh the, 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 okay. The event. Okay. But uh, just, just as a further explanation, I know of teachers will do the, um, try to get books for the kids in their class when they do the scholastic books. Not all kids can afford to do that. And to have like sponsors for buying some scholastic books for the kids in a classroom. You know, and, and that would be, be something like this. And I guess I'm wondering if one of the things that's not in green, it should be brought to teachers' attention, that these can only be done with the specific approval of the superintendent. Because a lot of those kinds of things, I think teachers like, this would be something good I'd like to do for my class. And they just get excited and want to go out and do it. And technically, you know, that's probably not okay if, if we haven't gotten it, the superintendent's approval. A lot of that goes into the operations. Superintendent in this policy means the superintendent or, in our case, his designee. So, um, you know, this could be an assignment that's delegated. You know, this, the situation, uh, Mrs. Voigt, that you're talking about could be delegated to the school principal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, crowdfunding for a fleet of vans to transport students here and there. That might go up the chain of command a little bit to, say, Mr. Clark, who's overseeing the business office. So superintendent is a specific and a general term in this policy book. Okay. Emma, do you have something to say? Well, I was just going to comment that my experience with this policy in my previous district was it was helpful that we had the oversight because sometimes it's technologically related requests and you want to make sure it fits within the district parameters because then you end up taking care of it right in other cases we saw a lot of flexible furniture and things like that and you want to make sure that it's high quality and, and durable so having the principal oversee it they can always check with steve if it's technology they can check with others and then we make sure that we're on the same page and we're also not doing so much of this that other types of fundraisers or other types where parents are feeling potentially tapped or yeah or overburdened that's a lot, yeah, that's a good point because it, they get to a point where they say, I'm done. Uh, Corey, sorry, I didn't catch you before. No, it's okay. Thank you. I agree with it. It makes sense. The only thing I'm seeing is it says all approved crowdfunding activities, but I don't think in there it says that crowdfunding by district employee has to be approved. I don't know if that was the intent or if I'm missing it. Okay, where, where were you? Oh, on the second green area? Yeah, I mean, it talks about all approved crowdfunding activities and it talks about the conditions, but I don't know if it actually says in there that crowdfunding by a district employee has to be approved. 
It's in the paragraph that's not in paragraph green, the third in paragraph. The black ink. In the black ink, third paragraph. Civic approval of the superintendent. Oh, I'm sorry. I completely missed it. I read over it four yep. times, so sorry. Yeah, that's never happened before. It's been a long week. <laughs> it's Tuesday. So. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, any other questions, observations on this? Um, what was it on 6605? Well, I think it's good to know that the, the superintendent means slash principal, you know, or designee. Okay. Do we actually add that for people looking at this policy to know that? Yeah. It's spelled out in the definitions in the Neola book. Okay. So you'll see the term superintendent in 90% of the policies. Generic. But the, the definitions of superintendent you know, gives a, a broader brush at the beginning of the book. You can see that early on me, in, the yeah. Neola, in the bylaws of Neola, you'll see definitions. Okay. Uh, let's see. This is one. It is a new one approval at the committee to move to the full board for final approval of the next board meeting. Am I reading the right one? No, I'm sorry. I apologize. Approval at the committee to move on to the full board for final approval. Would be seeking approval at the committee tonight for this. Pardon? We would be seeking approval at the committee tonight for this. Yes, so we can take it to the board in May. And I move that we approve policy number 6605 on crown funding as presented. Thank you. Second I'll second. By Corey? Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other discussions on 6605? Seeing none, all in favor of accepting it, please say aye. 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 Opposed? 3 0, uh, Julie. Okay, and we have an action item. And uh, this is a new uh, policy approval at the committee to move on to the full board for final approval. This is the, I'm sorry. Move on to committee for 563001 use of seclusion and physical restraint, restraint of students. And this one has some real discussion possibility so Joe I'm going to leave you yeah so we've had seclusion restraint in the policy book for a long time now um, the uh, state legislature I believe it was last year I apologize as we've had the COVID in between uh, last year um, updated the seclusion and restraint rules for the state um, and as a result of that Neola has provided some policy guidance to keep us in compliance with that uh, the first area to note in here is it defines incident and it clearly defines incident. There was, for as long as we've been working with seclusion and restraint uh, in special education and then in schools in general, um, it was always, you know, if I put my hand on Corey's shoulder to help guide him down the hallway, did I just restrain him? You know, so they get, they get very specific now um, in what an incident is. There's some other um, minor, you know, feasible, they, they add the term feasible in there. Um, they talk about the type of um, the type of prohibitions around, you know, like not being able to lock a door, and we want to make sure that we don't have door locks on our on seclusion rooms, which we don't. Um, we talk about the prohibition around mechanical or chemical restraints, um, but then we provide the clarifier around what is not a, in this instance, a mechanical restraint, because sometimes you have to have. Uh, devices in place to help support students' posture, for instance, help them sit up in chairs and stuff like that, or things to help kids maintain balance as they're working on their mobility in school. Um, it provides a broad definition of what parent means, so parent, guardian, um, it does not then, you know, so we wanna make sure that we are informing the proper individual, so it has the, um, the communication pieces associated with this. Uh, we have to communicate anytime we uh, do seclude or restrain a student to a parent. It's specific in the type of timelines that we must follow, um, who we contact, uh, how we follow up and review with staff, um, and then when we have a, uh, a record of that mailed to families and when we have the reports available uh, in our office. So you can see that about middle of the policy. It also talks about our annual report to the state superintendent. We do submit this information by December 1st uh, to the DPI um, so that they have a record of how many times this was done in our school. Uh, we al it also talks about uh, 
uh, the need to reconvene the IEP team uh, to consider if the IEP is appropriate uh, after I believe it's the second restraint for a student uh, within the same school year. So if you we have to restrain me as the student the first time, we follow all those reporting steps. But if it happens again, you're reconvening the IEP team and you're talking about the services that are provided to me. Um, and that really captures the, the essence of the policy changes. Um, just to give the committee some perspective, we, and I, and I mentioned this last night at Safety and Security, we do all of the nonviolent crisis intervention training with our staff, so all of our special educators are trained so that we can prevent the times that we need to use seclusion and restraint. Um, when we do have to use seclusion or restraint, we have trained our special educators and the need to do functional behavior analysis, develop a behavior intervention plan, work with families, work with providers to make sure that we're not getting to that level, taking as proactive of a step as we can. So we do a lot of work on the front end and then making sure that we document and follow up appropriately on the back end when we do this. Okay, Diane? I just wanna share one insight that I have. It, in the fourth paragraph, it talks about seclusion is defined in the law as the involuntary confinement of a student. And one of the things I've, I've become aware of is the, the concept of a calming area oh. as being a, you know, a calming oh, area. C-A-L-M. C-A-L-M-I-N-G. That my, my, my daughter who's in 4K, my granddaughter who came home that's in 4K was telling, telling me that she was gonna set up her own calming area in her room because that's what they have in, in, at school. And she wanted to pick just the right things to be there when she needed to be in her calming area. You know, which books and which stuffed animals and things like that. And it's like, for that to be part of the, you know, her, her telling me about the need for that. Because sometimes you need a, a place to just calm down a little bit, you know. And it's like, it's amazing that that's part of the, you know, what's being taught already at 4K in our district. We have a, we have a number of students who have a lot of proactive measures in their IEPs where they may have to step away. You know, I, I might feel agitated in class and there's a sensory area in the school where I can go to. Mm -hmm. That's not seclusion of a no, student. I'm just going to ask exactly. you. The, the seclusion is when my behavior becomes escalated and I'm a danger to myself or others, and then I get escorted uh, using those nonviolent crisis techniques. I get escorted to a room uh, so that I can de-escalate my behavior. Oh, so again, okay. the proactive okay. things, not seclusion restraint, this is something that falls into the category of a response. But it's a very positive step for the kid to take. Correct, correct. We hope that that's how 99%, 100% of the things are handled, but we do have to have that allowance for if it does become escalated. But on a non-seclusive basis, do we keep track of the fact that this kid is controlling himself with calming? That all factors into the individual IEP discussion. Okay. So yeah, we would we would look at that from an individual IEP discussion, but, but not. Because that's, that's, that's a pretty interesting add-on for me that, that he or she can self-initiate this, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Corey. Thank you. Um, it's an extremely important issue. I mean, we're dealing with what authority do our educators and staff have to lay hands on students. Um, and it essentially is to prevent that student from harming themselves or laying hands on another student or staff. Um, I know this is your expertise, uh, one, of, one of them. Um, the only issue I have is this is such a big issue, an important issue. Um, I think it'd be perfect for a, a um, I can't think of the word. Work, workshop? Workshop, thank you. Or at least be um, presented at some place in a workshop or something? Yeah, because I've got a lot of questions. Nothing's really challenging this, but I just need to learn more. Um, I just think it would be great to hear from an expert in the field and what the other opinions are, just so the board's, not to assume they're not, but more educated on what this is. Um, I know, I think we talked about it a number of months ago. Um, so I... It's a suggestion. I would love to see it. Um, I think it's an interesting suggestion, and uh, timing is good. Is there a... Thank you. I'm sorry. No, I think the timing would be good if we start thinking in this direction, because uh, first of all, I've been a long time since I got entered any information about this, but to, to hear about it again, and then we're going to have some new people that should understand... This is part of what we do. Take you through it in a you know more of a practical sense beyond the policy, so that you can hear about the training that our staff does. You could get kind of a brief overview of the nonviolent crisis. Um, you know, we could even have you sit in, you know, if you're just observing. You could sit in and see how that training is handled. Uh, we have trainers in nonviolent crisis. We've got people who have specialized in behavior for a long time. 
I'd have to defer kind of to what the board's calendar is. I know you guys are busy here. A couple of weeks, perhaps it's something we could look at in the summer to prepare ourselves for next school year. Mm -hmm. I thought, good. It'd be great. Do we, every one of our schools has a certain number of people that are trained in dealing with this? We have an expectation that all of our special education staff are trained. Okay. So we have, I, we have a, about 190 special ed teachers, um, therapists, all trained. All of our principals are trained in nonviolent crisis. Um, all of our special ed assistants, as they're starting up with us or they've been with us, they're all trained. That's about 170 people. So I safely would say we have about 25% of our district trained at a minimum. Oh, technical repair. <laughs> okay, that's, thank you. Okay, um, further comments on the seclusion restraint policy. So how does this work? If we're going to do a workshop, is there an urgency to get this changed? Or do we, do we table this until? There is from a legal standpoint, um, because there are reporting requirements that we must hit with the DPI that... It would be nice to have supported in policy. Should the DPI want to come in and audit us, they would tell us that our policy would be. So I guess that would be my recommendation. We proceed with it. We always can come back as policy if there's an issue. Agreed. It looks like this is discussion tonight and then comes up again next month. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I read that wrong? Yeah, discussion tonight and then we move back to the committee because it's a legal update. First reading. This is the first reading tonight. Right. And then, and then, yeah, this has to go through two readings and then to the board. Yeah, so we'd be back in May with this. Yeah, so we will be working on it another month yet. I'm sorry, I, I did misread that, I think. Okay, um, so that's act, active on that. Um, I guess that's the last policy we have to talk about. Am I right? for other um I, I have a note to myself under other that um there and it's been brought to my attention diane knows about it too there are a couple things that we want to be sure that we are presenting in the near future and reminding people of and it is policy 3231 which deals with things you should not be or can be doing on business business time in the district for instance campaigning uh, during a work day here in the building is inappropriate. Uh, and then it's a bylaw on just the, the corporate ethics that members of the, the organization should be following the ethics. Um, we're not going to take that up as a discussion item, but in the future we're going to probably present that possibly at a workshop. So, okay. And I have one additional. Please. Thank you for raising those two. Um, I think that we need as a board to review the open records requirements. Um, as I've been subject to eight open records requests, I've learned a lot more about the open records policy that is in place. And the, I, I to totally believe in the value of the open records law. And I think it's an amazing expectation for us to be willing and able to be able to produce the documents that are related to, 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 to business. But during the course of the last several months, um, as, as Superintendent Siebert knows, I've been subject to several that I think are bordering on imp imposing on your personal life and doesn't have anything to do with, with you know, actual school records, business records. Um, although I've shared, and I have a, a document here I'll share with you, um, a little bit of an insight into the, the examples of the, and I had emailed this to you. Examples of the types of open records requests that have been made of me personally. Um, one of them being looking for all of my personal messages between myself and my daughter for a six months period of time. 
and you know, I went to WASB, the, our, the Wisconsin Association of School Boards Legal Council, and just said, seriously, can they do that to me? And they said that it needs to be a, an example of a, of a, a real record of business that's, that's being transacted related to school. You know, my messages about what we're gonna have for dinner on family night should not be subject to anybody and everybody who wants to do an open records request on the communication between myself and my daughter. Um, we were able to c cut that down dramatically to one month instead of six months. And then it's like, what are you looking for? You know, specifically ask for the topic. And then literally there was nothing that fit that, that criteria in the end result. But that was a, a very extensive kind of challenge of what I thought was like, is that really open records? Is that what, I, what I'm as a school board member expected to be opening to the world? Um, beyond that, it's been a lot of my email communication. And I think it's important for all the rest of the school board members to know that this is, if somebody contacts me at my Diane Voigt email versus my school district of Waukesha Devoit email, if it's something that's business related to school, I need to forward that to my Devoit and, and make, it, make it available in the archives that are automatically happening in the school district. And again, didn't, didn't know that. You know, questioning now the things about my personal, um, again, not here per se in, the, in what I've documented, but questioning the kinds of things that are happening on my Facebook account. If it's Diane Voigt for school board, you know, which, is, which I did run through the campaign, should that be open to, open to you know, public records? You know, it's like, I, I have nothing to hide. You know, I'm very willing to open it up and let it be. But I think that school board members need to know what is and what isn't subject to open records law. And that we can that we can be be meeting the criteria of the law and making sure, like I said, personal things that come to my personal email, if it's business, should be forwarded, you know, et cetera. And that that's an expectation. I think the way that I will probably want to approach this is to review what's in the policy itself. And you and I can do that and see that. Because some of what you said wouldn't be relevant to the policy so much as it is to what happened with with that. And then we might have to have, again, an, an element of education on that, whatever we've talked about in the policy and the, the stuff that you've added, which isn't part of the policy. We may need to add that to the discussion items in a general capacity of the board. Does that make sense? Or did I babble that too much? <laughs> okay. You know, I just, for anybody that is on the school board, I think they should be realized what, what's, what's part of open records. We've had the training. We had the lawyers come in. We did a workshop on it. Yeah. But I never, in my wildest dreams, thought it was going to turn into the experience I've had in the last six months. You know. Yeah, and, it, and, and education is important. Continuing education is important for the board. So, it, Corey. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've had open record requests, too, and I had a recent one that asked for my text, um, my law firm, email, everything. Um, and I, I looked at it, there's nothing there. I supplied what I had. Um, with Mrs. Voigt, I support open records. We can't change the law. Um, right. But to educate ourselves, you know, what is an open record? I had my own Montio for school board page um, and everything's saved on there. Um, so yeah, I think it would help because it's pretty complex. So that's it. I think we do have a policy related to the, the, the electronic communication via email. But some of these other things, you know, I, I didn't expect that that would be part of it, you know. Well, it's often the case is experience generally drives policies. And so you'll probably see, I'd venture to guess that Neola would even make their own recommendations around the retention of records differently after this, you know, this 2020, 2021 cycle of elections where, um, you know, they, they're, they're now going to be responding to things differently as a, as an organization. So, um, you know, I know that, you know, we have the ability to do board workshops. We can consult with our own council to come in and work with the board on kind of what their experience has been. They represent a lot of school districts and, but you know, I've heard of Dr. Siebert and you know, our board president to try to figure out what's the best avenue to do that development. Thank you. Right, go ahead. And I think the, the other thing that was really pertinent to me was the feedback I've gotten from my Pardon? contacts. To, the other thing that I think is really pertinent is the feedback I've gotten from contacting the, the Wisconsin Association of School Boards legal, legal hotline. And they just said that it's really important to be able to narrow it 
to a specific topic. You know, the idea of, you know, that oh. I share in my example of like, you know, 600 email messages in the school district of Waukesha during a, a 10 day period. It's like, what are you going for? You know, that's such a waste of time for staff to pull all those emails and redact all those emails by our legal counsel and et cetera. It's like, what are you looking for? Give us a specific. If you've got a specific, go for it. You know, I, I, like I said, I totally believe in open records, but this becomes a matter of fishing for something that they don't even know what they're looking for. And it's such, such a waste of time and effort on, the, on behalf of our staff that I just, I hate to see it happen again in the future. Thank you. And, and, and anything else, Jimmy, got anything you want to share with us on policy or? or oh, he, he's, he's trying to learn from us. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm not that sure that's a good idea. <laughs> no, it is. We really work hard at this, and I, I appreciate that from all of you. So with that, that does get us to the uh, end. So at this point, or in our next meeting, I have to write the date down. Do you have? Uh, yeah. Oh, I do have one other. Pardon? I do have one other. Can I do another? Okay, sure. Yeah, just, just say. 18th? Uh, Diane does have something else. It was just a follow-up. And I had it in my, in the, my minutes review rather than at the end of the, the other topics. We had approved and the board approved 7-1, the policy about legal counsel, 0172. And we talked about possibly bringing it back here to look at some other things, if, if just, just as a follow-up, is that something that we still want to have on the agenda in the future? Okay. Just as a follow-up to the discussion at the board okay. meeting. Yeah, we can do that. Because we did it at the board meeting to talk mm -hmm. about the fact we might want to go into that in more detail. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to. And it's passed, you know, but, but just yeah, as a courtesy to continue looking at it. Yeah, if I probably looked at the right place, I'd have found it in here. <laughs> okay, uh, May 18th, for the next meeting of the... Um, Committee on Policy. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.